Very good. Well, hey, uh, we are back. Uh, the la- last week we started a new series called Why. Um, that we uh, we uh, talked about Scripture last, last week. Why Scripture? What value uh, do we as Christians find in Scripture? And we, we looked through some... some uh, has some secular evidence as well as some, some internal, some scriptural evidence as to why uh, scripture is so important and what makes that book stand out um, as, to pose, as opposed to anything else, um, uh, any other works of, of writing or, or literature uh, throughout history. Uh, this week we're going to continue with that, uh, that mindset. We're going to continue asking the, the question why. Um, this week we're going to talk about church. Uh, why church? Why, uh, why, why do we have church on Sunday mornings? You know, we get two precious days for a weekend. Why, why is church so important on, on Sunday morning? And, and we're just going to gonna go through that. And, 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 you know, a lot of people, they go to church for a lot of different reasons. Um, some, uh, some, they wake up uh, to the, the beating of their spouse hitting them, saying, Hey, let's go. Time to go to church. <laughs> you know, some of us, we're the ones beating our spouses. We're saying, yeah, it's just Sunday. Let's go to church. All right, let's do this. All right, and then uh, you know, there, there's lots of other things. Some people go to church. Uh, you know, this this is you know something I need to do. I don't really want to, but it's what I need to do. Um, and and you know, so we have lots of different motivations. Lots lots of different motivations for for why we go to church. Um, so, but today we want to talk about why why do we have church? I mean, why why do we have it in the first place? Why? Uh, um, why, why is it so valuable? Why is church a valuable part of a Christian uh, walk? What's the value in it? Um, and, uh, and as we talk about that, uh, we, uh, I want to I read a, a passage in Matthew. So if you have your Bibles and you want to open up to Matthew 26, or no, sorry, excuse me, Matthew 12. Uh, Matthew 12 um, will be in, starting in verse 46. Um, but, but this passage, uh, Jesus is talking um, and as we read it, you may look at it and you say, well, that doesn't have anything to do with church. Um, but, uh, but what we're doing, we, we want to define what church actually is. What, what is church? You know, we, we start out to, you know, people have a lot of different thoughts. Um, for as many reasons as people go to church, there's also that many thoughts of what church is. Um, you know, there, there's people that say, okay, church, uh, it's, a, it's a building, it's a meeting place, that's what church is. Other people say, no, church is the people, it's, it's the the people that way. Other people say, well, church is really an organization of people that get together. When they pass the plate around, that's the membership dues. You're just supposed to know how much you put in. Um, and and, and that's, that's what church is. And it's, it's, a, it's a club that you attend. You have to attend at least on Easter and Christmas and then once a month um, throughout. I mean, so there's some different views on, on church in that respect. But what is church? What is church? Uh, Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is talking here, starting in verse 46. Um, While he was still speaking to the crowds, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside uh, seeking, seeking to speak to him. Someone said to him, behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers for whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven he is my brother and sister and mother and so so when we look at this we think all right that doesn't have a whole lot to do with church it doesn't have a whole lot to do with church however when you really look at what he's saying there and who he's saying it to and about who he's saying that about he is basically he's bringing his disciples into his family into the family now, family is very significant um, to especially the Jewish culture. Uh, the Jewish culture prior to Christ, if you weren't in the family, the, the, the literal family, then you were, you were lost. Um, you had to find, your way to find a way to get in, um, but, but you, were, you were lost. If you were not a descendant of Abraham, then, then you had problems. Because in the Old Testament, the deal was is that Abraham was the father of, his, of God's nation. Abraham is the father. So if you didn't have Abraham bloodline, then you're just out of luck. Um, and, and that was just an unfortunate uh, part of, of, of life in the Old Testament. If you weren't in the family, then you were out. And you were out. And then Jesus in Matthew here, he says, we're changing some things up. Who is my family? 
And then he points to his disciples. He said, this is family. This is family. These people that I'm not related to, this is family. The, these guys right here, these are family. And so, so he's redefining the deal. He's redefining the deal in this is that, and eventually those disciples become the church and become the church. And so this morning, we're looking at that and saying the church is family. We're family. That's, that's what the church is. That's what we're talking about. When we talk about church, we're talking about family. Um, and, and so as we, as, we, uh, as we look at this and as we look at um, what the value is and what all that means for us, uh, we're going to be talking a lot about family this morning. We're talking a lot about family, but we're also going to be talking a lot about church because ultimately we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about the exact same thing. And, and you know, the, the idea of family, it's nothing new to the church. Uh, the church, we've, we've considered ourselves family. There's an old hymn called The Family of God, and it goes, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. In our church, I think we used to sing it every Sunday at the end of church. I don't know if any of you had the similar experience. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so we, we, we've got that. It's nothing new, you know, in the, uh, we're familiar with the idea of, oh, this is our, my brother in Christ or my sister in Christ and, and, and some different um, terminology that way. So the, really, the idea of a church being a family is nothing new. Nothing new. Um, we, we understand we're family. Um, but this morning when we're talking about church, I want us to really, really think about what that means. What that means and what value that brings to church. Um, and so, so as we talk about that, we're going we're gonna to look at four different things. If you're a note taker, there will be four on your list. If you don't end up with four at the end, come see me. I'll give you the other one that you missed or that I forgot to say or whatever. Um, who knows? Who knows what could happen? Um, but, uh, but no, there, there are four things that, uh, four aspects of, uh, four areas of value of church. Four, the four areas of value that, that we find in church. Um, and, and we're going to start off, number one, church done right has trust. Church done right has trust. When you're in church, trust has got to exist. Church is valuable when there's trust. Church is valuable when there's trust. Think about it in your family. Think about it in your family. There's trust in family. There's trust in family. You've got to have trust. You've got to trust your spouse. Um, you've got to trust your spouse or that relationship isn't going to work. All right? You've got to trust your kids. When you've got kids going into teenage years, you've got to trust them. Because if you don't, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. You've got to build trust. You know, kids have got to trust their parents that they're going to take care of them. All right, and, and they're going to be there. And so there's a trust. There's a level of trust in family. In the ideal family, trust is, is very crucial. It's very valuable. And families who have trust, that's a very valuable family. That's a very valuable way to live because trust is huge. Trust is important. Um, Proverbs chapter 3 uh, in verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. And so it's not only trust with people. It's not only trust with people, but in, in church, we have a trust with God. We have a trust that God is going to take care of us no matter what. That God is going to get us through whatever we're going through no matter what. And we have that trust there. A church that trusts God is valuable. A church that trusts God is valuable. And so, so individuals... As individuals, as people, we're called to trust God. That's part of our trust. That's a valuable aspect of our church, of, of the church. Um, uh, you know, in the book of Acts, we, we talk about trusting, not only do we trust God, but we trust, we're called to trust other people. Uh, church, is, a valuable church trusts other people. You trust each other. Um, in the book of Acts, uh, you, we, we talk, we've, we've really, we've covered a lot of the first part of Acts over the last month. Um, we've talked about uh, how the first church kind of got originated, how it got moving. And remember, the first church, they were selling property. They were selling property and, and giving the money to the church. They're saying, hey, listen, I, this is something I want to do. I trust you with this money. And so, I mean, can you imagine? They, there, there's people that, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming they're selling farms. So let's say today you sell an 80-acre farm. You're looking at between 150 and 300, 400, however much it is, 300, 400,000. And you're just, you're taking that money and saying, all right, elders of the church, I trust you with this. 
do whatever you want. That's trust, isn't it? That, that's pretty trusting. That, that the elders aren't corrupt, that, that the elders will do the right thing, that, that we're not going to squander it on, on whatever. But that's trust. That's a trust. And, and the church that has trust, the church that's trustworthy, is valuable. So, so when we're looking at the value of, of church itself, church has got to have trust. Church has got to be trustworthy. <clears throat> we, uh, we've got to trust each other. If, if you come here this morning and, 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 and I'm preaching and you don't trust me, if you don't trust the words that I'm saying and, and, and it's been going on for a while, you know, I just don't trust Dan. I, I don't trust him. I don't, don't know what he's preaching up there, but I'm not listening. All right? If you've been coming to church and you don't trust me, I'd suggest you go somewhere else because we haven't found a new pastor yet. I'll call you when, you, when we find one because you're not going to get anything if you don't trust me. All right, if, if you're not willing to, to study Scripture with me, if I'm not a trustworthy person, a part of the church, and, and you don't want to study with me, then please don't waste your time. I mean, it's not going to waste mine. I'm, I'm here regardless. But, but don't waste your own time. If you don't trust the person you're listening from, what's the point? If you're sitting in a church and you're working in a church and you don't trust the leadership, there's some problems there. You, you, if, if we don't trust as a church, if we don't... If, if we're, number one, if we're not giving reasons to be trustworthy, that, that's our number one concern is to make sure that we are being trustworthy people. Number two, you know, if you don't trust the church, if you don't trust the leaders, if you don't trust the people that are doing the, the work of the church, then ultimately this isn't the place for you. And, and, and I wish I could change it, but trust has got to be there. We've got to trust each other as a church. We've got to trust each other as, as, as individuals in the church. So trust is huge. Trust is a very valuable part of church. And, and when we have a group of people that we can trust as individuals, that goes a long way. That goes a long way to our relationship with Christ because there's people that we can trust with the stuff that we really don't want to share with anybody, but we can trust that we can share it with them because they're church and they're trustworthy. And so, so trust is huge. The second thing on our, our list, the aspects that we're looking at, that, um, the aspects of value to church. Church done right is characterized by truth. Church done right is characterized by truth. If we lose truth, similar to if we lose trust, you're wasting your time coming to church. All right? If, if, you, if you're going to a church and you're unsure, I really don't, I, I, I'm pretty sure that this has nothing to do with Scripture. And let's say that you've, you've contacted the leadership, you've sat down with them, you say, listen, this is what the Bible says, and you're doing something different, and they're not changing, I would strongly suggest finding somewhere else. If that's us, I, I sure hope that you would, that you would question, question the leadership, question myself. If, if we ever say something that you're like, that isn't what Scripture says, please, before you leave and just, all right, I'm, I'm gone, they're, they're not preaching Scripture. Please tell us because I don't want to be in the boat where I'm misleading people. And if you can do something to help me out with that, that'd be great. All right? But truth is that important. Truth is that important. I was telling the story of uh, uh, Paul Longer, and he's a cowboy church guy. Um, Paul, I, I was, it was just two or three years ago, I was preaching a nursing home service. And, and I, I, you know, it was one of those deals I kind of forgot I was supposed to do it, and then it was Sunday, and I was like, Oh no, I've got to I've got to preach a sermon this afternoon, um, and I, I kind of threw some stuff together. I'm not proud of it by any means, but I, I put this sermon together and 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 I preached a sermon. And by the time I was done, Paul Longren came up to me afterwards. He said, "I don't want to be too critical, but John the Baptist didn't actually write the book of John." <laughs> All right, that, which is one of the claims that I had made quite boldly. <laughs> Um, which, by the way, John the Baptist didn't write the book of John. The Apostle John did. Um, different people. Um, you know, four-year Bible college guy, he, he preached that. So, a um, uh, little bit humiliating, but the truth is that important. If, if Paul would have never came up to me, I, I sure hope I would have caught that at some point in time. Um, but if Paul wouldn't have come up to me and said, hey, listen, this is, this is truth, you were a little bit off. Then... You know, you know, on that one, hopefully I'd ever correct myself, but what if I didn't? What if I didn't, and what if it was more crucial than just an author error? 
what if it was a, a doctrinal error? And, and, and I preach it, and you're like, I don't think that's right, but who am I to say? You know, if we don't engage ourselves, if we don't put that kind of investment in the truth, in the truth of what we're teaching, of what we're preaching, then really we've lost our value. We've lost the value of the church. And if, if we've lost the truth, if, if we're not preaching the truth, you're really wasting, everybody's wasting their time on Sunday morning because we're just coming talking nonsense. And, and so, so the truth is vital. The truth is vital, and it's a vital part of the church. And luckily, we're a part of a church that that is what we focus on. We're a part of a church that focuses on Scripture. We're a part of the church that, that, that I'm okay to admit that I might be wrong, even though I'm a preacher. All right? I, there's a good chance I am a lot of times. But this, that's the value of it is that you and I are working together, church is working together to make sure the Scripture is being presented accurately and understood accurately. And that's important. That is vital to the growth of the church. That's vital to, to our growth. I was, watching a, uh, I was watching a program on the other night. You guys, uh, some of you may have seen it. Uh, it was about the real extreme versions of the Mormon church um, down in, in southern Utah, Arizona. Um, there was, uh, it, was, it was a documentary. They were interviewing this lady who had grown up in it, in polygamy and, and, uh, and all that. And she was taught from, from the time she was a baby, listen, you're going to be married to a guy. You're going to share him with, with uh, lots of wives. Um, you, I mean, you're just going to have to deal with it because what we do here is you don't ask questions. You say yes. And, and, and there, there's no questioning anything and there's no saying no. That's just the rules. That's what God, and, and this is how they taught. They said, this is what God wants you to do. Well, I, I mean, if you are raised that way, that, that's a horror, that's a, I, I can't imagine trying to be in that mindset, being programmed that way, and just not having any idea of what the real truth looks like. They were completely, raising these kids, raising these, these kids to think, oh, yeah, this is the way life really is. And, and there's no questioning that. You don't question, you don't ask questions, you don't do anything, you just live it. Because if you ask questions, that means you don't have faith in God. And, and there, just this horrible, horrible, I mean, it was, it was going through the life of this, this girl and all the, all the mess that she had to live through, but that was God's calling on her life, according to the, the, the guys who were over the top of it all. And it's just, it's just sad. It's just sad because the, they were without the truth. And, and ultimately, they're destroying lives. They're destroying lives and, and, and you know, they're, they're basically, you know, these people are brainwashed. They, they have no idea. They, they have no idea they're living in this, this horrible, horrible world because that's all they know. And they've lost the truth. There's no value in that. There's no value in, in, in that. Church has value because we seek out the truth. Church has value because... We're not afraid to ask the why questions. There's value in that. We've got to ask why, because if we don't ask why, that's when we start getting on those paths where well, you just don't question that. You just don't, you just don't question that. You just don't ask that question, because that's not a church question. You, you don't ask where God came from. You can't ask that question. Oh, well, you can ask where God came from. You may have a hard time finding an answer. But you can ask, and I encourage you to ask. All right, so, so we need to hold on to the truth. Um, Acts chapter 5 illustrates that very well. Uh, I'm not going to read it, but uh, many of you know the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, Ananias, uh, Sapphira, he, they, they decided, hey, we're going to go out, we're going to sell some land, we're going to give some money to the church. Um, the problem was, when they got it all sold, they said, hey, you know what, we need to keep some money back, pay some bills. Fine, you know, nothing wrong with that. It's okay to give money to the church. It's okay not to give all of your money to the church. There's nothing wrong with that. All right. However, what they did is they said, hey, we sold this land, this is all the money, have it, knowing full well that they held some back. The truth is gone. The truth is gone. It's a lie now. It's, it's yet a gift, yes, but a worthless gift because the truth is gone. So worthless, in fact, that, that Ananias fell dead. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was God's way of illustrating the truth is that important. This church is brand new. This church is brand new, and this, there's no room for this. There's no room for for the the truth not to be there, and so that well that was just, that's the story of Ananias and Sapphira emphasizing truth's got to be there. If we don't have truth, we're wasting our time, and so we've got to have trust. We've got to have truth. 
Uh, the third thing, the third aspect of, uh, uh, of the value of, of church. Church done right must be open to growth. Church done right must be open to growth. Excuse me. You know, when you think about, uh, you think about uh, family, there is nothing that brings more joy to a family than growth. Um, new, new children, whether that be sons, daughters, grandsons, granddaughters, great-grandson, great-granddaughters, growth brings joy. There, there's an uncomparable joy that, that you have with growth. There, there's nothing like it in the family. That growth is a part of it. Now, on the same end, growth is a scary part of it. It's a scary part of it because of all the of all the time restraints that it's going to take. Your life is no longer your own. Your life is no longer your own. It is your child's now or your grandchild's or, or however that is. There, there's a whole new purpose for life when, when you have children or, or grandchildren or, or however. That new life, it's a scary time. It's a scary, it's a scary time because it, it's going to make some change happen. You're not just going to be able to leave right after work and go down and watch a movie till midnight, all right, because there's a baby at home. All right, there, there, there's change that, that it's, it's inconvenient for sure. Change is inconvenient. In the church, in the church, we get really comfortable. We get really comfortable in church, and we find our group of church, and, and we hold on to it. We're like, all right, this feels good. You know, I, I like this group of people. Let's just shut her down. Let's just shut her down, and, and let's, let's, let's have this group of people. That, that's fun. Really, I've been a part of those, and, and it, it's great. It's great. I mean, you, you're close. You're 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 in sync. Everybody everybody's thinking the same ways. And then you ever have the Sunday school classrooms where then somebody new comes in? You're like, oh. you, you don't you don't say it out loud because that's not appropriate. It's not church appropriate. You're supposed to invite people. To, but really, underneath, you're like, I really like it the way it was. You know, it, it's it's not convenient. It's not convenient for sure. Um, but there is a satisfying feeling at the end of growth. And you know what? We did something for God. We did something. It wasn't easy, but it was definitely worthwhile. It was definitely worthwhile. And it was a, that was a change that, that we didn't know about at first, but you know what? This is, this is the right thing to do. This is going to bring more joy. Like children, it's going to bring more joy than anything we could have done on our own. Then by closing our group off and, and doing that, you know, we lose our purpose. We lose our, we lose our vision. Church has value when it's open to growth. Church has value when it's open to growth, and it's not just numerical. Church has value when it's open to spiritual growth, when it's open to maturity. When we think about our families and, and kids, and they graduate high school, and there's that, 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 proud, that proud parent feel, and, and, and you've got that, I have, you know, uh, this, this is going good. My son or my daughter, they have really accomplished well. And, and, and this is, uh, I, can, I can die happy knowing that they're going to be all right. Um, and, and we have we have pride in that, and we have joy in that growth, whether it be numerical or spiritual. We've got to be open to it. We've got to be able to move, and it's not just going to happen by throwing our Bible in the car, leaving it in there, just driving to church, going there once a week, spend an hour. You know, we'll maintain it best if that's all we're doing. If we're going to spiritually grow, that's that's all we're going to be doing. We're going to be maintaining at best. Spiritual growth takes much more. It takes Bible study. It takes an investment on your part. It's not fun, but it's rewarding. It's, it's fulfilling. And it's, it's, uh, it's something that, that, uh, that brings great value to church. And without it, without the idea of growth, without the idea of, of, of without openness that we want to grow, that we want to move somewhere, you become stagnant. And at that point, you're just existing just existing and and as a church that's not what we're called to do as a church and and so so church has value when it's open to growth like i said it's not it's not easy it's not easy it's going to be it's going to be uh, very inconvenient imagine the uh, imagine the church in acts in acts chapter 2 um, peter preached his sermon at the end of the day 3000 people were added to their number all right imagine all right, number one, no building, no building, no money, you know, nothing. Now you have 3,000 people that know nothing about Christ, but they really want to, and you've got a handful of leaders. <laughs> That's a problem. 
All right, that's inconvenient. All right, I'm sure if the apostles, you know, kind of, you know, the ideal life, let's, hey, let's, let's uh, you know, Jesus, he, he, he wants us to wait for him, so let's just wait. Let's wait. Let's live life out. Let's wait for Christ, and, 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 and that, that'll be our goal. But, but that's, not what, uh, that's not what God called us to. That's not what church is all about. Church is about being open to growth. I can't imagine what would happen here if we had 3,000 people added on. We'd have to have church out on the hill, number one. Sermons would have to get real short in the winter, probably real short in the summer when it got hot and cold, hot. It, you know, it, <laughs> I, I just can't imagine. We'd have to have four full-time staff just to cook communion bread. I mean, I, it just, I can't imagine what that would look like. But that, that, that's what the New Testament church, that's what they went through. That growth, they, they had an openness to growth. They said, hey, listen, God's called us to grow this church. Let's, let's do it. And, and that's what happened. That's what they did. Um, <clears throat> in, uh, now, coming to our fourth one, uh, church done right is, uh, is a give and take. Church done right is a give and take. Churches that have value, church people that have value understand the idea of give and take. Now, the, the thing about uh, give and take, uh, we need to find a balance. We need to find a balance because there, there are certain people in the church that, uh, you know, we could probably make a list of them, but they are very, they're dangerously close to giving way too much. Dangerously close to giving way too much. And there's no take. You know, those, those are the people that you know they're not coming to church to be fed because they don't have time. They, they don't have time. They're, they're greeting people. They're, they're teaching Sunday school classes. They're, everything they do at church is all give. And there's very little take, if any at all. That's a dangerous place to be in. Now you think, well, that's kingdom work. That's what we're called to do. We're not called to come to church to take. I, I believe there's some take that needs to happen. Because without take, without take, we have burnout. Without take, we have burnout. And when we have burnout, then there's no more giving because you're burnt out. Imagine it in a family relationship. Imagine a family relationship where one spouse gives all and the other one all takes it all. I, there, there's just no give and take. That relationship doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. Give and take in a family, it, it's just that. There are days that, that, that you need someone to, to serve you. And that, that's, that's what you need. And there's other days that you need to get off your duff and go serve somebody else. All right? So there, there are things that, uh, that we uh, as a church, the church done right, has a good balance of give and take. Give and take. Uh, Jesus understood this. Uh, in the last hours of, uh, of his life, he went, to, he went to the garden. And in Matthew, uh, I think this is Matthew 26. Yeah, Matthew 26. Uh, 36 through 38, uh, Jesus, Jesus uh, sits down with some of his disciples. He said, listen, this is what I need you to do. I need you to stay here, and I need you to keep watching and pray because I need to take at this moment. You know, Jesus, the guy who gave it all, who gave his life, at that moment in the garden, he said, listen, I can't, I can't deal with you guys right now. I need to go and take. All right? I, th this isn't a time for me to be a teacher. This isn't a time for me to give. This is a time for me to go to the garden and pray. And so Jesus understood there's a, there's a balance. There's a balance to that, that, that there is some take that needs to happen. You need to be spiritually fed at some point in time in church. Church has value when you can take. All right, now, on the other end of things, you can't just take, all right? That's bad. That's bad for you, all right? That, that gives us this, this idea and eventually the mentality starts that okay I've been taken, I've been taken, I've been taken eventually the mindset happens that okay God owes me God has died for my sins yes but he still owes me All right, that's not a good place to be that's not a good place to be mentally, that's not a good place to be spiritually there's got to be a healthy relationship between give and take there's needs to be met but yet your own needs need to be met at the same point in time um, church done right is a give and take, and so this morning, as we as we come closer to a, a come to a close, um, we're we're looking at, uh, at at the things that make church valuable. The things that make church valuable, trust. Trust is one of them. Trust makes church extremely valuable. If we can have trust in church, then then it's extremely valuable. Secondly, truth. If, if we lose truth, we've lost our value. I mean, there, there's, there's no sense meeting if we're not speaking truth. 
if we're not studying truth, if we're not, if we, if we don't have our head in the game, there, there's no reason to be in here. Um, truth is vitally important. Uh, we've got to be open to growth. That, that's part of the design. Churches, churches is, is open to growth. That's, that's, that's how it thrives. It makes it valuable. It makes it valuable. A church is valuable when, when, when we can be open to new people. We can be open to new challenges in our own life. When we can do that, when we can grow, when we can be open to that, church is valuable. And church, church is valuable when there's that good give and take. When, you know what, you can come to church and you can know, hey, there's going to be an opportunity for you or, and for me that we can just sit down and we can be ministered to. And, and, and you know, we can come and we can, we can gather and, and it's just good. It's just a, that there's that time, there's that time that you just need to take. And then there's that other time where, you know what, I, I can come and I can do this. I can make cookies for Sunday morning or I can, I can, I can sing in the band or I can, do, I can do this stuff. I can help. There's got to be a good give and take. And so as we talk about the value of church and, and, and how church is like that, what if, let's imagine, let's imagine that church and family, what if, what if, what would happen if we saw church the way we see family? What would happen if when we come on Sunday mornings, it was like coming home on a Friday after work? What would that look like? What would that look like if you knew that you were coming, you're like, finally, I can go to a place where, where I, can be, I can be completely honest. I don't have to put on any, any show. I don't have to, I have to do that. I'm, I'm coming in and I, I can be completely honest. I can trust that these people are going to set me straight. I can trust that, that uh, you know, these people are going to welcome me. And, and, and all these things. What would happen if church became, or our attitude towards church was family? What if we valued church like we value family? Because our, our value for family is high. We, we, we love our family. We, at least in the ideal in the ideal family, and I realize there's some people that, that have come from some very rough families. And I apologize, and it's not my intention to, to, to illustrate the church as, as being like that. The church should be like an ideal family, a, a, a dad and a mom who love each other, um, kids who, who love each other, who love their parents, and, and, you know, the ideal, the ideal family. That's what we're, that, that, that's the value in churches, because that's, re, in reality, that's what it is. Jesus Christ said so himself. He, he pulled the disciples and he said, this is family now. This is family. These, these people, these are the ones that are close to me. Imagine it like an onion. Imagine it like an onion. Church is like an onion. The center. The center. It's you and, and a spouse. Or you and a best friend. Or you and, and that person that you know, you know you could tell anything to and they wouldn't think any less of you. All right, and the layers get, get a little bit wider. And the layers get a little bit wider, and, and then there's that two or three people that, that you're, you're with, and you're like, you know what, if, if we're going to do anything, there's, it's, it's my husband and I or my wife and I and, and this couple, and, and we, that's, that's church. That's church. That's family. That, that's family. And then the, the circle gets a little bit bigger, and maybe it's your Sunday school class. Maybe your Sunday school class, you, you know that you can sit in Sunday school class, and you can... You can, you can talk about things and, and you can have really good discussion and you know that that's real. You, you, you trust your Sunday school. You, you, I mean, that's just, that's church. And then the onion gets a little bigger and then you're talking about the third service at Circleville and okay, this is church. And as this onion continues to get bigger and we look and we're part of the Circleville Christian Church as a whole and part of the Jackson County Christian Churches and, and part of the Kansas Churches and part of the... the the, the country and the world's churches, as this onion gets further and further out, we see that we're part of something much bigger than, than, what, than what really we can, we can fathom. The energy is so much bigger in church than what we can fathom. But this is what it takes. It takes the center of that onion. It takes the center of that onion being a strong bond. The center of that onion has got to have this stuff. It's got to have trust. The center of that onion's got to have trust. It's got to have truth. Um, the center of that onion's got to be got to be willing to grow. You've got to be going somewhere. Um, you've got to be willing to grow, and it's got to have a give and take. That's church. That's church. The Bible says, "Where two or more are gathered in my name, 
uh, there I will be also. Two people is church. It doesn't have to be Sunday morning. We don't have to paint a box around it and say, okay, we're going to church. Because, yes, where this is church, much more importantly, church happens in much smaller numbers. Church happens in much smaller numbers. In two, four, six, maybe even ten. Not a whole lot more than that, though. Church is vital. Those relationships that we build in those small groups, whatever that group may look like, you know, I'm not going to sit here at the end of the day and say, okay, we're going to divide up into churches and, and here's that, because that wouldn't work, all right? You, you, you know where your sphere of influence is. You know where your church is. You know the people that you can talk to, the people that, that are real, the people that, that will, will give you truth. You know, the thing about truth and family is uh, they're, they go hand in hand, don't they? Uh, I, I know this, this doesn't happen in any of your families, or it certainly doesn't happen in mine. But there's times when, when I'm, or not I, somebody is in a social event. Social event, and uh, I'm there with their wife or, or husband, and, and they're, they're, you know, talking. And, you know, everything's fine there. Then you get home, all right? And then they're like, hey, why on earth did you bring that up? That's truth, right? That happens in family. Like I said, it doesn't happen in your family. Doesn't sh- most certainly doesn't happen in mine. Um, I have most definitely never preached on something that I've gotten in trouble for later. Uh, <laughs> all right, but, you know, th- there are things in family that, that truth, that, that's just part of it. If we didn't have truth in family, if we, didn't have, if we didn't have trust in family, family wouldn't work. Same thing with church. Church is valuable because church is full of those things. Church is full of trust. Church is full of, of truth church is full of, of a welcoming spirit and the openness to growth and, and, and church, church is, is, is about taking care of people, both yourself and others and so that's what church is all about and so this morning as we have a chance, we're challenged, we ask why on earth, why church why church, church is valuable because of all these things, church is family and without family we're alone and we are most certainly not designed to be alone We've got to have somebody. We've got to have somebody with all of these qualities. We've got to have two or three people with all of these qualities that we share. Doesn't even have to be here on Sunday morning. Probably most of the time it won't. But wherever that is, that's what church is. And that's what we need to be a part of. Will you guys pray with me? God, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to, uh, uh, to just uh, um, look at your word um, in regards to the church that you have given us. Um, God, we, uh, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to, uh, to not have to do this alone, to, uh, to gather with, uh, with uh, one another, to be able to, uh, um, to have a support, to have people that we can go to that we know they're going to tell the truth, um, to have uh, people to go to that we trust. Um, Lord, I pray for, uh, for this church as a whole that you would just continue to, uh, to mold us together, continue to unify us, and, uh, and to, uh, to continue to, to put your work ahead of us um, and, and your people ahead of us, Lord, so that we, can, that we can further your kingdom. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.